Hi everyone, welcome to the St. Louis County Library uh, interview with Rachel Hazel Hall. I'm Heather Ash. Hi! I am a writer and the past president of Mystery Writers of America Midwest chapter, and I was also on the national board, which is how Rachel and I got to know each other. Yes. She is a former national board member, uh, currently a Southern California chapter board member, and she is the author of And Now She's Gone which is her newest standalone novel. And then They All Fall Down, which came out last yes. year, has been nominated for a Lefty Award, an mm -hmm. ITW Award, an Anthony Award. Mm -hmm. These are really big accomplishments in the mystery community. So that's really stellar. And now we've got your second standalone. Yes. Tell us a bit about, without giving too much away, about the plot uh -huh. of this novel starring your new character, Grayson Sykes. And now she's gone. Uh, is about Grayson Sykes, who is a new private investigator. She is just starting out and she gets her first case and her client, Dr. Ian O'Donnell, is looking for his missing girlfriend and also the Labradoodle that he's named, Kenny G, uh, that <laughs> Isabel has taken with her. So Gray needs to find this woman who actually wants to be missing. And so in her investigation, she goes from Los Angeles. It's another Los Angeles story, the kind I love telling. Mm -hmm. um, from Los Angeles to Vegas, to Mobile, Alabama, to Oakland, in search of this woman who just simply does not want to come back to her life in Los Angeles. So it's a, it's a cat and mouse game, but it also discusses pretty important, heavy so topics like domestic abuse and race. And, you know, it's funny, I always, in my books, in Los Angeles, you may have heard that our seasons are weird, but we also have fire season. And little did I know when, you know, I was writing this last year that we would have the grandest fire season of all. I'm sure you're, you've gotten some of that smoke in your skies by yeah. now. Cause I know New Jersey has. Air. So mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, Ray is doing all this investigative work under a murder sky, I call it. You've talked in the past when, when, you, were, when you wrote um, They All Fall Down about our hidden stories yeah. and our hidden selves. Yeah. And I really thought you were hitting that, especially with men and women's perception of men as they all are great until the moment that they're not. Yeah. Can you I talk a little bit about that? I mean, Ian, yeah. was, Ian was really like, is, is your typical like jerk. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but we also right. see that in some of the other men. Yeah. And Ian O'Donnell, he is a jerk, but he's also a cardiologist, you know, so he gets to be a jerk because we allow doctors to be whoever they are because they heal people. Right. Um, we allow mm -hmm. some men to be worse at things than others because they're hot. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of unreliability, in many ways, all of them that I, that, that I talk about, um, from uh, Dominique Rader, who owns the, the, the firm that Ray works for. Um, of course, Ian, who, why is Isabel missing? What did you do to her? Did you do something to her? Mm -hmm. Did she run because you are a jerk and she just couldn't stand it anymore? To even um, yeah. Grayson's adoptive father, who he adopted her, yeah, but then he got sick. He got sick and left her alone, not because he wanted to, but because that happened. And so she's going through life with men who have, and, and of course her, her ex, who is the mm -hmm. epitome of unreliability. So she's gone through life looking at these men who have, have some way made her promises and have mm -hmm. kept her until they don't or who've okay. promised to love her until they can't. So, yeah. you know, it, it reminds me of that, that line that Alice Walker writes about in The Color of Purple, you know, a girl child ain't safe in a world of men or something like that. And mm -hmm. it's very true for, um, for, for, Is for Isabel, yes, but also for, for Grayson. And especially for Grayson because, because there's no stability in her relationships with men yeah. And even where they are stable, she's, there's a line in there where, where it says she's ready to cut and run at a moment's notice and yeah. she won't look back, Yeah, and which is very interesting to have. Yeah, exactly. 
it, yeah. it, unlike Lou, um, my heart broke a few times for, for Lou, but Lou mm -hmm. had like her best friends. She had her mom, even if her mom was kind of unhappy with the trajectory of her life, she still had her mom. And for Grayson, she has people, but they don't know who she is. And all mm -hmm. women, I would say, there are parts of us that people don't know who you are in the privacy of your homes. I mean, it took a pandemic for me to see the inside of your house. And it's like, oh, there's that plant over there. I wonder if Heather's the one who, who, who waters it or is it her husband? You know, you, you don't know mm -hmm. what's happening in someone's home. And that brings up, you know, abuse. We've mm -hmm. all um, been friends with or related to women who are experiencing trauma in the privacy of our, of their homes. And you don't know because they put on the makeup and they put on the right. smile and they're, you know, badass in their jobs and you just don't know. And I'm fascinated by that duality. I, I'm interested in how we all relate to each other and how we're all perceived by someone and are we worthy of help? You know, mm -hmm. Gray decides, you know, she has to make a decision. Either she stays on this case and, and, and grows up and becomes the PI that she wants to be, or she remains kind of looking for lost chihuahuas. It's like, what do you want to do in your life? And what mm -hmm. challenges are you going to face so that you get better? You get stronger. But, but can she even make that plan at the beginning of the book and, and even towards the end, she is not in a stable situation you can you can't plan when yeah. half of your brain is out the door looking over there uh-huh or looking yeah. at your back because yeah. she has reason to believe that that she's not safe right right and for, for various reasons for various reasons personal and private and mm -hmm. right how do you prepare how how can you catch a breath and regroup if you're always on the move and so yeah. i you know, I wanted her to catch a breath. And there are moments where she's close to finally taking a deep one and, and releasing it. But, you know, the reality is a lot of women can't do that. And now she's gone is actually the second version. Is that accurate? Yeah. Of yeah. this idea. Mm -hmm. Because this, speaking of unpredictable men and you think you know someone, this came out of a fairly famous... Um, uh, missing persons case oh yes that's right oh so a while ago you all may remember this olivia newton john he had this boyfriend and they what he went on a yacht trip took his boat out and he fell overboard and was missing forever and you know olivia newton john mourned and we all like mourned with her and then he turns up in Puerto Vallarta like several years later. He faked his death. He faked disappearing. And I thought, oh my God, that's a great story. How, one, how do you do that? Two, why would you do that to someone you love? That's like straight jacked up. And so, you know, as mystery writers, we tend to mm -hmm. have that little kernel tucked away and it turns and turns and turns. And then I thought of um, a story that, well, looking around at that point when I was starting to write it, it was called The Flight of Venus. And it was after my first book, um, A Quiet Storm. And mm -hmm. The Flight of Ven Venus is a, was a famous um, magic trick that Houdini used to do, making oh. fear. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ah. But, you know, when I wrote it, I was, when I started it, I was like 30, well, I was like 33, 34, just starting to write especially mm -hmm. genre, just, just trying to figure it out. And I didn't know how to write it, but it was important to me because I wanted to tell the story of, I wanted to talk about uh, domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by this Olivia Newton-John story. And I was fascinated. I love magic. So making mm -hmm. things appear, I love it anyway. So I wanted to combine all those things together to create this story. I didn't know how to write it, and, but I still wrote it because that's what we do. And I mm -hmm. tried to get it um, sold and no one would buy it. And so I didn't throw it away. I trumped it, of course. And it took all of my you know, life experience and trauma and all the rest of it health-wise and 
writing the loop books and all that to finally understand how to structure this novel and and now she's gone here we are Mm -hmm. yeah but this is you know a message to those young writers who just want to give up and toss it don't ever toss your don't ever toss your work because you just because you don't know how to write a story today doesn't mean you won't know in 10 years and that sounds far away 10 years but books take forever to get done and this mm-hmm. is a marathon. And if it's a great story, it's worth waiting. You want to tell it right. And talking about those books. So you know that I am the hugest Lou Norton fan, your four-part series, which when I recommend this to friends, I say, um, you know, if, if you like Michael Connelly's Bosch series, which is w- in which LA is very much a central character of that story, mm-hmm. um, of everything around Harry Bosch, you will love the Rachel Housel Hall, Los Angeles, that is Lou Norton's world, because it's not what you expect. And it's not something that most people are aware of. And can you talk about that? Because you grew up in in Los Angeles and and you talk about both where you grew up and where you live now, how those are influences and, Mm -hmm. and even how that part of your lived experience kind of put people off at first in their expectations. Yeah. I am a native. I love Los Angeles. Believe it or not, there are some people like, you love it? It's like, yes, I do. I mean, of course, there's some bad things, but there are bad things everywhere. But Mm -hmm. I have, you know, greatest food, good weather, and diverse as hell, which is so important to me. Um, Mm -hmm. I live in, I I, I live south of the 10 freeway, which means I live, you know, in the Crenshaw area of Los Angeles. And that's a historically black section of Los Angeles. I live in Windsor Hills, which is part of uh, one of three uh, little neighborhoods called Black Beverly Hills, where a lot of, of affluent African Americans live. Uh, Tina Turner had a house here, and Gray says this to Ian O'Donnell, and he's like, "Eh, whatever." John mm-hmm. Singleton had a home here, like Black glitterati. That this is where you live, but you know, just on the other side of maybe uh, less than a mile away, it's still black, but it's not as shiny and glitzy. So while we have um, the great neighborhoods with the big houses and, you know, Bentleys and all the rest of it, we're still going to the same Ralphs as when we didn't, when when we hadn't arrived, when Mm -hmm. I grew up, you know, I grew up down the hill uh, Mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. If you, if you've seen training day, that's the neighborhood where I grew up Mm -hmm. and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's rough. But it's, you know, in Lou Norton's series, I, I mentioned that just because the area is poor doesn't mean that the people there have a poor mind. And I right. grew up with very um, aspirational parents who were like, just because we're here doesn't mean that we have to be here in here. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't get that, that there are vibrant parts of Black Los Angeles that, you know, you don't get to see see on TV all the time. You, you see, of course, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills. You see Calabasas now because the Kardashians and Justin Bieber live there. But you don't see, you know, like I said, south of the 10, the lives here. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's being gentrified in some ways. And that kind of sucks because right, right now I can't afford my house. But it, we're still trying to keep it to, you know, as vibrant and wonderful as it's always been. Um, Mm -hmm. I like writing this part of Los Angeles because I want people to know that we're here and, you know, we jog and we walk our dogs and we wash our cars. And since the pandemic, my neighbors, we've taken to having once a month these pandemic block parties Mm -hmm. where we social distance on our lawns and our neighbor is a DJ. So he brings out his equipment on his lawn and we all just like hang out and dance on our lawns until 11 o'clock at night. We do things like that. Yes, yeah. there are helicopters from the you know the sheriffs, and yes, people are killed all the time. But you have to live somewhere, and I would rather do it here than, you know, somewhere else. And it's so funny because block parties are a very Chicago phenomenon as well. Growing uh-huh. up in the suburbs of St. Louis, we never had that. So when um, Stir of Echoes, uh, that Kevin Bacon uh-huh. movie that came out, when when yeah. they show a Chicago block party, I was like, oh, that's that's so weird. And then we moved to Chicago and this is the thing to do. So it's right. so funny because I see, yeah. I see it 
<laughs> pop up on your, you know, on, on yeah. your social media. And I was like, this is very, you know, of course, yeah. because this is also what we do in Chicago. And I think it's just neat to see these glimpses of how the experience is the same in a lot of places. Yeah. Um, well, and that's, that's, that's been the challenge for me as an African-American writer, um, getting, um, like, especially white women to read my stuff. I mean, they look and say, oh, she's writing about Black people, therefore I can't relate. And it's like, no, think about it. Blacks, mm -hmm. Latinos, Asians, everybody else reads Stephen King. And we all right. get something out of it. I've never been to Bangor, Maine, but his stories resonate with me. Uh, a Los Angeles native, Black girl living, you know, here. It doesn't matter, you know, what I look like. Women are, are scared of their husbands sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. Women are frustrated with their lives and some of them disappear on, on, willingly. It doesn't matter their color. We, we all right. experience that. We're all experiencing the pandemic right now. Mm -hmm. When I say, ooh, Lysol, <laughs> you know yeah, all of us what I mean. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, oh, well, only black women use Lysol. It's like, no, we all know the thrill of seeing Lysol on the counter again. So mm -hmm. there's some things that just transcend, you know, race. And I'm hoping, and it's happening more and more, that people are willing to open their minds to more than just their, their, their immediate experience. I think it was, remember when the Me Too movement was first in its, in its infancy a couple, a couple of years ago, I, you know, none of us know time at this point, yeah. right? But, but I, and I'm sure this happened for you, I was suddenly having conversations with my friends, mm -hmm. where people were coming forward with, well, I was assaulted, yeah. I was raped, I was, yeah. that we'd never had these conversations yeah. before. No. But it was universally uh -huh. um, coming up that so many women had been traumatized yeah. in their lives, experienced this trauma, Right. Um, and right. it wasn't specific to, to black, white, Asian, rich, mm -hmm. poor. It was universal. Yeah. And, yeah. and that fear is universal yeah. for women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was on a panel a few years ago and we were talking about safety or something. And I was thinking, you know, just how, uns how women are trained different from their childhood than mm -hmm. in boy children. And I was talking to my husband and I said, you know, explain to me how you get home from work. This is when we used to like work mm -hmm. in building. So you remember that time? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I get my stuff from my desk. I go to my car. I get my, my car, drive down La Cienega and I'm home. And I said, for women, we get our purse. We make sure our keys are in our hands. We sometimes put the keys in between our knuckles just in case, you know, somebody is following us. We get on the elevator, hoping no strange man gets on the elevator with us. We get in our cars, but before then, we look in the back seat to make sure that no one's in that back seat. We pull out of the garage at work, hoping that, you know, no one's following us. We're driving down La Cienega. He's looking at you, and if you have a skirt, he's trying to, you know, in the next car, he's trying to see what's down your skirt, and you hope he doesn't follow you when you turn onto your street. Mm -hmm. You pull into your driveway, you hope the alarm is on, and if it is, then, you know, you, you, well, you're hoping that it is, because if it's not, then that means, oh my goodness, uh -oh. someone's at the house, right? Yeah. So, and finally, you're home. So just a simple journey from your workplace to home is filled with trepidation for women all the time. And men don't have to think about, I better get my keys out now, right. wherever you are, before I leave, because I want to just get in my car. And I like infusing that kind of, you know, every day holding your breath just to navigate through life mm -hmm. and then add race on top of that. It's crazy, right? It's yeah. like, no wonder we're all exhausted because we're constantly, I hope it all works out in the end. Right. And, and now we're kind of living in universal fear in, in yeah. an interesting way. And, yeah. and you had a very funny, um, the writers among us were, were looking at Facebook going, oh yes, uh, the day in the life of a writer, how glamorous <laughs> it is. 
<laughs> where you're sipping champagne in the video, yes. <laughs> ironically. And then you, you show it like it is, which is you're up at 5 a.m., yeah. sitting at your table. And I know that you were going to work because what most people don't know mm -hmm. is you are still working full time. I am still working full time. I am still not as a writer. I mean, you are writing full time in your day job, but this is not the same writing that we are consuming right. and enjoying. Yeah. It's a challenge sometimes. And as we get older, I, I hit 50 this year, uh, I get a little slower and mm -hmm. You know, and, that, and that's a little scary because I was very regimented, but I am regimented about getting up at five, partly because my dog now, she goes to pee <laughs> at that time. So it's like, okay, I'm up. But I like having structure. I know what I have to do. I know that I only get a finite amount of time. My writing job, um, it actually helps. Like my day jobs have helped me with this journey. One it frees me to think about writing in a fun way. I don't need it mm. to eat. And mm. can't, it's hard to create when you're hungry, when you're scared. And so that day job has allowed me to do that. But it's also helped me to write on a dime. You know, mm. someone died, we need a condolence letter. Okay, by when? In the day to day. So I don't, I'm not precious when it comes to writing. There's no, oh, I don't feel like it because I wouldn't have a job if I didn't feel like writing, you know, right. Reports and everything. And also, you know, I'm, I'm committed to my daughter seeing that whoever she becomes, she becomes someone's mom, someone's uh, spouse, that she can still have a part of herself that is who she is. I have always been a writer and I will always be a writer. And that is mine. And if that means me getting up at five o'clock and writing until seven, and then, you know, doing that every day, then she knows that it can be done. When you were your daughter's age, because you have a teenager now, mm -hmm. who were you, who were your influences when you, when you were her age, uh -huh. who was like, oh, I want to be like that person. I want to write this kind of thing. Jackie Collins. I loved me some Lucky <laughs> Santangelo. He's like, uh -huh. I want to be an Italian mob princess. How do I get to do that? I want to have this glamorous life. But There's I still want... time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Goals. Yeah. But, you know, I, I always liked genre. I found that, yes, it's entertaining, but I learned things about places and people and situations that I would have never learned about. And Jackie Collins bought this whole New York East Coast thing again with a very strong, savvy, sexy, funny, powerful female character. I liked that. And, you know, I dreamt of, I wanted to be like Jackie Collins, but I didn't think it, think it. I didn't think, you know, you could be someone other than Toni Morrison and Alice Walker as a writer. It took mm. me um, until I start writing at, Penn Center USA West, which is an arm of Penn American Center. And that's where I met working black writers. Like Gary, that's how I know Gary Phillips because oh, okay. Gary yeah. was a board member at Penn and mm -hmm. I was the administrative assistant there. And I met ah. him and it's like, you're black and you write genre and you're a writer and I can do this. And that's where it became a real thing for me. It, it was him and... Jervy Turvalon and Paula Woods and all these great black writers, especially LA writers that mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, you all are my North star. And that's the second part of my answer. It was just regular everyday uh, writers who just commit to it and love it. And this is what they do. Left bank books. So www.left-bank.com has your book signed yes. when this airs. So you can get this for yourself in hardcover. I have the advanced reader copy. I want this signed too, by the way. Yes. Um, I, looked, I looked online. They also, you can order this, the Shattering Glass Anthology, which Down Girl appears in. And I'm going to plug this. The Yay. first Lou Norton. I mean, I love this. I love this yeah. book. And, and I keep, every time I see it, it's like, when will Lou come back? Because cause in the fourth, she's driving off in yeah. the car. I'm not going to say anything else. And, and it's like, okay, what happens next? And, and I want to know. But you can get this too and also get hooked. And we're going to start a writing campaign um, to get the fifth novel in there. 
<laughs> but before that happens, tell yeah. me what you're working on now that we can expect in the near future. So next August, I don't have the exact date yet, will be my next novel um, called These Toxic Things. And it's a story of a young woman, her name is Mickey, who is basically a high-end scrapbooker. I call her a digital archaeologist. She's a tech writer oh who um, works for this company that makes these memory banks. So it's like an Alexa device, but you can put your memories, pictures, and mementos of things, and there's a little holograph. And so she writes, um, she curates clients' memories. Okay. And this one client uh, owns a curio store. Nadia owns this curiosity shop. And she has these items that she wants curated and so she can remember and plan back forever. And as Mickey's working on this that first day, Nadia's murdered the next day. And so okay. Mickey's trying to figure out what happened and also continuing on to curate these items because the family wants this. They paid $5,000, so we want our memory bank. But there's mm -hmm. something up with that store and with the curios that Mickey is curating it. And there's something that's weird with her own origin story. So ah. family secrets and haunted things and more of LA because this is, LA is my jam. And yeah, so next August. I know a lot of us are having trouble getting through a book. This one was, and, and, and the benefit of knowing the author is I was texting you Yes. <laughs> in the middle of the story. I think I have Someone it. so did it. <laughs> I, I think I know. Yeah. <laughs> Which was, it's always a nice bonus. Yeah. To having authors as friends. And, and it was not, even though I do this professionally, how many books we, I did not predict yeah. this ending, did I? Yes. No, you did not. <laughs> no, I was off. Yes. Um, but it was earned, you know, you not knowing. I, I, I like writing stories. Yes, it may have a twist, but I want to earn that. And, so. and you totally did. It, it was not out of nowhere. You laid the pipe on that one. Yeah. Amazingly. So, so this is definitely very complicated. Um, have a notepad, maybe, unless you're going to read it like all in one night. And you might have to, but, <laughs> but this was really, really fun, exciting, and, and chilling because as we've talked about tonight, a lot of people are going to find something to relate to in yeah. this particular story. Yeah. And then, you know, you sign up, you get a glimpse of LA that maybe you didn't know. Yes. Um, yes. So yes. thanks for being here tonight. Thank you. And thank you, St. Louis County Library, County Library. Thank you for inviting me and uh, asking Heather to host. We are thrilled that we're here. Thank you. Very excited. And Carrie Robb, who coordinates this. Um, thank you, Carrie. We love you, Carrie. So <laughs> thank you very much to her too. And you guys have a good night. Good night.